Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning so today we are going to uh, talk about uh, a very exciting area of film studies that is film remakes film sequels and film series um, before i start going deep into the area i would suggest that those of you who want to know more about this uh, uh, topic they should read uh, this book by constantine verovis it's called uh, film remakes okay so it's a seminal book on film remakes so we know what's a sequel a sequel carries a movie forward a plot forward for example um, let's uh, consider the godfather film uh, so the first godfather ends with the death of don corleone as played by marlon brando and his son taking over his son michael corleone that is al pacino and he taking over the empire and uh, there is also that famous montage with uh, uh, the killing of the rival mafia families so this is a uh, uh, this is how the movie ends okay um, the previous dons entourage or his supporters they kissing michael corleone is hand and thus giving him the power that uh, once belonged to his father now um, the second godfather takes the entire story forward we have to remember that uh, uh, the godfather was based on mario puzo's novel of the same title and uh, while the first godfather is uh, uh, based on the novel the second godfather the second part the sequel is uh, entirely a creation of francis ford coppola so we have been talking about the new wave directors and how they wanted to be authors and one of the major desire of the authors was to uh, completely uh, to have complete control over their materials including writing their own materials so coppola was not too happy with uh, the first godfather because it wasn't based on his own work but he was uh, more excited and he consider, considered it his more fulfilling achievement because the second godfather was after all his own creation um, including uh, the written part of it so that is a just a brief introduction to what is a sequel a sequel starts once the earlier film ends a series or a franchise goes on and on and on and as we have seen oceans series so oceans need not be sequels okay they are not they are more like a series and after all they are also remake of a famous and very popular tv show of the 60s so the oceans was also based on a tv show starring the so called rat pack so that was what uh, the recent ocean series is so uh, it can go on and on and on without um, are being uh, much familiar with what happened in the earlier part of it okay so uh, that is a series remake is more complicated because you are taking something that has already been there a text whether it's a literary text or a cinematic text or even uh, again like ocean series you know um, it has been in existence um, in form of uh, a tv show the saint also the movie uh, starring val kilmer was based on a tv show starring roger moore so uh, all these are extremely complicated 
commercial, industrial and aesthetic categories and practices. It is not very simple to understand the theory of remakes. So, uh, there is much that goes on when somebody makes a remake. For example, let us consider our own Dawn, Shah Rukh Khan's Dawn. I mean, if you consider the 70s Dawn starring Amitabh Bachchan, it is a, it's a, so much a movie of the 70s, you know, you have the film playing on uh, Amitabh Bachchan superstardom and uh, his double role and also the fact that uh, the good guy lives on. So, that was so 70s, okay, that we, we that movies have to have a kind of moral centre. But uh, when we look at uh, the post-liberalised dawn and we see that uh, is the first uh, is the is the good guy that gets killed halfway through the film? Of, uh, of course, uh, we are told this only at the fag end of the movie. The so-called villain or the anti-hero, he lives on, and there is also a sequel to this dawn. So, it is more, and it has been accepted in a big way by the audience. So, we are talking about another star uh, for post-liberalized times and his kind of audience. So, he is not just uh, a national level superstar, but uh, Shah Rukh is also uh, a global phenomenon uh, and a very popular um, star. The second dawn or the new dawn um, for Anakhtar's directorial venture, it caters more to uh, a different kind of an audience. So, therefore, it may be a remake, but then it is a remake with a major twist. So, every remake and it has to, it has to cater to its audience and the changing socio-political culture of its time. So, that is something that we have to understand, remaking is not an easy job, remaking is also a very complex, complicated task. So, um, we know that in the godfather, uh, the second godfather. Um, it deals mostly with Michael Corleone consolidating his power, whereas in the third godfather, the focus is on Michael as a much older man trying to divest himself of his power and atone for his sins. So, you know life comes a full circle for Michael Corleone, that is the idea. So, that is what a sequel does. Now, all sequels need not be numbered. So, we have we have first or second or third godfather, but then we have a very popular sequel such as the mummy returns, uh, which is a sequel to the mummy. Then we have the lost world, which is a sequel to Jurassic Park and even uh, um, something as uh, light hearted as Johnny English reborn uh, 2011 movie, which is a sequel to Johnny English, a very popular film by uh, Rowan Atkinson. So, these films refer to the earlier films in the titles uh, and again they continue a sort of franchise. Again we have films such as Superman. Okay. So, uh, it is all very complicated, it is not easy to understand Superman 1, Superman 2, Superman 3 and then uh, those are numbered sequels and then the in between there was a lull and again we come back to Superman Returns in 2006 and then we have more recently we had you know which was produced by Christopher Nolan. Again we can say the same thing about the Batman series, I mean Batman was something else altogether when it started as a TV show in the 60s, it was more like a cartoon show, but uh, Tim Burton gave it uh, a dark edge, ba Batman was no longer a cartoon, cartoonish show, uh, his movies with uh, Michael Keaton were quite deep and then Christopher Nolan of course, as we all know in from with his Dark Knight series, he took the, the character to another level giving it more shades, more nuances, more edges. So, that is what we mean when we say that it is a very complex and an open ended category, very postmodern category. 
Now, we know that we are also consumers of James Bond movies along with uh, Indiana Jones, Terminator, Rocky, Dirty Harry, Pink Panther, Rambo, Karate Kid, Ghostbusters, Star Trek, uh, Aliens, Cars and every movie can be read or watched in itself, by itself and the consumers of these films, they look forward to the another, to the next installment of the franchise. Now, these films are generally major studio productions and are high concept films. Now, see we are talking about film as an industrial practice and there is a concept called high, uh, the term called high concept where uh, which means uh, big budget, big studio and uh, uh, big sets and very often having big stars. So, even in, a, in an animation like Cars, it is not that uh, uh, there are no stars, you have Paul Newman doing the voice for one of the characters. Again in The Lion King, you had several major stars uh, doing voiceovers for the um, animated characters including Jeremy Irons and uh, Nathan Lane and also Rowan Atkinson. So, um, what I am trying to tell you is that these are uh, franchises are high concept films, they are not cheap. They have large budgets, they have wide distribution and they resort to mass scale advertising. These films at the end of it are important part of our growing up. All of us have grown up with uh, the Star War films and once these films are packaged, repackaged, re release, remade, we all look forward to these and they have now, uh, they have become a part of our film going experience. Now, um, sequels may not always be very worthy or very popular. For example, we have been talking about uh, Roman Polanski's Chinatown uh, quite often in this course. And, but Jack Nicholson's The Two Jakes, which is a 1990 film is not at all a worthy successor to Chinatown. Here again, Nicholson plays the hard boiled uh, detective Jack Gittis and he, repri he reprises his earlier role and finds himself at the center of new deception, new lies, but things are not the same. For a remake or a sequel, one has to really do wonders with the subject as was seen. Uh, by uh, you know the, in the efforts of Christopher Nolan in The Dark Knight. Films such as Scarface, The Three Musketeers, uh, they have been made and remade several times and every time they meet with a huge amount of success. So, Scarface was originally a Howard Hawks movie starring Paul Muni and Scarface is uh, an El Pacino movie uh, uh, directed by Brian De Palma and uh, scripted by or it was written by Oliver Stone. So, uh, it was uh, a huge mammoth success. So, it all depends on the treatment that the directors or the writers give and also the fact how important that film may be for uh, the audience, the target audience and for the uh, uh, catering to the contemporary times. Three Musketeers and all the remakes and adaptations of Jane Austen or Charles Dickens or even Shakespeare's works, okay, these are universal in appeal and they always meet with uh, uh, varying degrees of success. Um, so, remakes are attempts to make again an earlier film often using similar characters and storylines. There are many reasons here aside from technological ones behind remakes, but some are also related to the notion of popularity. Now, Three, uh, Three Musketeers has been made remade uh, several times okay? uh, and the most recent three, uh, version also provides Vakshya style martial arts action sequences, which is funny because uh, these are the times we are living in and you can't perhaps the director must have felt that uh, you no longer can rely on the old kind of audience. So, to cater to the newer kind of audience you have to resort to these uh, sci-fi 
and martial art practices is another story that the attempt was not too well appreciated by the audience as well as by the critics um a very a worthy remake uh, is cape fear now cape fear is a uh, was basically a black and white 1962 film and uh, this was remade by martin scorsese starring robert de niro and nick nolte and robert de niro plays the role of the psychopath uh, who is seeking vendetta this role was originally played by robert mitchum now both robert mitchum and gregory peck stars from the earlier cape fear they make an appearance in the newer version again we can consider that how is scorsese is playing homage to the original version of scorsese being such a cinephile also noteworthy is scorsese's the departed which is uh, an oscar winning remake of the hong kong film infernal affairs i would like you to watch the two scenes one is from infernal affairs and then uh, you should also watch the same scene from the departed this is the rooftop scene so here is the link from the 80s onwards a new pattern of dealing with series sequels and remakes emerged in hollywood this included filmmakers such as martin scorsese who did cape fear in 91 steven spielberg who did raiders of the last ark in 1981 george lucas's star wars of 1977 francis ford coppola did bram stoker's dracula in 1992 and his dracula is not the bloodthirsty dracula that we used to we were used to uh, from the 40s or the 50s but this is a more sophisticated more refined kind of a dracula uh, as played by gary oldman then uh, we had of course brian de palma's scarface is a supreme achievement and paul schrader's the cat people so most of these films are uh, uh they have the nostalgic values in other words they these films nostalgically invoke old genre sometimes remakes count on the audience's memory of their own famous uh, predecessors as with the invasion of the body snatchers in which the star and director of the original 1956 movie makes brief appearance at times other remakes have obscure pre- uh, predecessors for current audiences for example victor victoria is a remake of the 1993 german film victor and victoria and true lies which remakes the 91 french film le total in india mehboob khan remade his own film aurat as mother india older movie is a forgotten classic but the um, the newer version that is mother india was is a timeless classic okay it has a universal appeal i'd like to talk about now two films which uh, most of you would be familiar with these films are both from the 80s now um, the remakes are from the 80s and from our own country so first is uh, uh, satya pe satta which is uh, a remade version of stanley donan's uh seven bright for seven brothers which is about seven brothers who are out in the backwoods and when the oldest among them uh, played by howard keel he finds a uh, uh, pretty cook as a wife now his brothers too want to follow in his footsteps the result is a highly energetic and entertaining musical here is a scene from seven bright for seven brothers now um, raj and sippy directed satya pe satta in the, the early 80s it stars amitabh bachchan this too is a musical but it reinvents itself as a major bachchan vehicle now now see we have to remember that uh, seven brides for seven brothers is an ensemble film it is not a vehicle for the stars howard keel or 
Jane Powell. But Satya Pe Satya is now remembered for various set pieces uh, with Amitabh Bachchan. Okay, focus is so much on one major star who is a mega star and other characters definitely do not get as much screen space as they did in Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. So, this is one aspect of key element of a remake. You see, in the 80s when Amitabh Bachchan was at the peak of his uh, superstardom, his fans, his audiences expected that the star should be seen throughout the film. So, therefore, there is a double role created for him which does not exist in the original as well uh, at all. The idea is definitely to play on Amitabh Bachchan's angry young man image, therefore the desire for the second role in the movie and also to give him uh, a major chunk of screen time. So, here is a scene from Satya Prasatta. Uh, I would also like to talk about uh, a wonderful film which is more like middle of the road kind of cinema, Be Misal. Now, this Rishikesh Mukherjee film is a remake of uh, a classic Bengali film, Ami Seo Shakha, that uh, film starred Uttam Kumar. Be Misal stars Amitabh Bachchan as a very complex character. He is a conscientious uh, doctor, but he, ha he had been a troubled teenager and he has suffered a lot and he is brought up by a uh, very kind family. Now, while in the original, um, the role is played with great alan by Uttam Kumar, the remake focused on Amitabh Bachchan's persona as the angry young man, although it is not the kind of the run of the mill kind of film that uh, generally we associate the commercial cinema category with. So, here is a scene from Amisi Osaka and you can also watch the, if you watch Be Misal, you can watch the same sequence with Amitabh Bachchan doing a similar song. Now, um, remakes fall into several categories. So, we have the category of re-adaptation. Readaptations are being as faithful as possible to the original source. For instance, the various adaptations of Charles Dickens or Jane Austen's novels. So, here is a faithful adaptation of Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights, a novel that has been very often adapted on the film screen. Um, this Wuthering Heights is a TV film starring Tom Hardy. Remakes can also be made more contemporary or updated. For instance, Buzz Lerman's Romeo plus Juliet and Clueless um, with Alicia Silverstone. These are the updated versions of the classic tales. One is by Shakespeare and the second is based on Jane Austen's Emma. So, these adaptations bear a transformational attitude towards the original text. Here is a scene from Clueless which is an adaptation of Jane Austen's Emma. I would also like to talk about Kurosawa. Kurosawa's Yujumbo is a 1961 film and it is about a masterless samurai played by his uh, favorite Toshiro Mifune who goes from place to place earning his living with his sword skills. He comes to a village with two business clans fighting each other and what follows is a big time entertainment film along the lines of popular westerns. Now, Kurosawa's Seven Samurai was remade in the US under its alternative title The Magnificent Seven and uh, the lone samurai hero Yojumbo was the inspiration for Clint Eastwood's man with no name persona most obviously in a fistful of dollars and then Bruce Willis did his own interpretation of Yojumbo in Last Man Standing which is a 1996 film. So, here is the opening scene from Yojumbo by Akira Kurosawa. You can also compare the opening sequence from Last Man Standing starring Bruce Willis.
Now, Kurosawa's reworking of two Shakespearean plays, Macbeth and King Lear into Throne of Blood and Ran respectively are considered some of the best adaptation of Shakespeare's works. Also remarkable is the way he uses no theatre tradition to interpret Shakespeare. Um, so, of course, uh, if, you if you watch the Throne of Blood, you will understand how highly stylized version of uh, Shakespeare's Macbeth it is, uh, combining the elements of no theatre. Okay. And here I would like you to watch our own adaptation by Vishal Bhardwaj in his Magbul. The Manchurian Candidate is uh, yet another uh, great movie which has been adapted and remade recently. The original version, the 1962 version was directed by John Frankenheimer and this is a cold war thriller about brainwashing, conspiracy, the dangers of international communism, McCarthyism, political assassinations and political intrigue. Now, the central roles are played by Lawrence Harvey and Frank Sinatra. Lawrence Harvey is uh, the senator's son who is brainwashed and the setting is the Korean War. He is a Korean War hero who is brainwashed particularly by his own mother and he is programmed as uh, uh, an agent to assassinate a US presidential ca candidate. The film is set in the early 50s during the height of right wing McCarthyism a time of tense political paranoia with the overriding fear that communists will soon take over. Its two memorable scenes are the opening brainwashing sequence staged for prisoners of war as a garden club party and the climax scene during a political convention in Madison Square Garden. Uh, the film uh, is uh, can be regarded in several categories. It is a war film, it is a science fiction film, it is also a black comedy and a political thriller at one level. So, here is the scene from the Manchurian candidate which is 1962 version. The Manchurian candidate, uh, the 2004 version was directed by Jonathan Dam, starred Denzel Washington and um, here the remake is now updated for the contemporary time. So, that is what I was telling you about that remake in order to be successful and the remake uh, the, the remade version of the Manchurian candidate was uh, an acclaimed commercially and critically version. So, it uh, and it updates itself to cold war, from cold war paranoia for the war on terror age. So, again it situates itself into the socio-political climate of the United States. So, the villains here now um, are no longer the communists or even the Iraqis whom um, our hero finds himself fighting in Kuwait uh, during the eve of uh, desert operation desert storm. Instead, the villains are the military industrial complex bigwigs who thirst for profit and control of the Oval Office. What do you understand when we say that this uh, film has a cult following or this film has a cult status? Now, uh, if you look at it very academically, the term suggests any film that for a reason and which is unrelated to its inherent or intrinsic artistic qualities, the film has or the work has attracted excessive devotion from a group of fans. So, any work that attracts devotion, unquestioning devotion from a group of loyal friends, it becomes a cult work. You need not worry too much about or too much, uh, do, you need not argue too much about the artistic merits or demerits of the work. Because a work is popular among a certain section of people, it becomes a work of cult. Okay. So, the, it acquires a cult status. Now, for instance, the Hollywood director Edward Wood on whom Tim Burton made a movie called Edward with uh, Johnny Depp playing the lead. Now, his films have gathered a cult following. 
the expression that is generally used in relation to Edward Wood was that he was so bad that he was very good. Wood's films were cheap and low budget and in inexpensive so much so that in his famous Plan 9 from Outer Space which is a 1958 science uh, fiction horror thriller, the spaceships were represented by paper plates and you could see that, but uh, it does not really matter. Here is a scene from Plan 9 from Outer Space by Edward D. Wood. The Rocky Horror Picture Show is yet another popular cult movie. It is now a great cultural phenomenon. This combines the conventions of science fiction, musical and horror films with also elements of gender interrogation. So, the plot concerns the misadventures of Brad and Janet, a young couple inside a strange mansion that they come across on a stormy night. Greeting them at the door is a gaulish butler called Riffraff who introduces them to a weird group of party goers dressed up in outlandish outfits. Things get stranger by the moment. Now, um, cult films are also known for their peculiar titles. So, uh, in the 70s, we had um, a um, couple of uh, directors who would cater to a section of audience and entice them with titles such as Faster Pussycat Kill Kill, Pink Flamingos, Santa Claus Conquers the Martians and Attack of the 50 Feet Women. Now, th these movies may not be artistically much to talk about, however, um, at the core of it they have a die hard audience and um, filmmakers such as uh, Quentin Tarantino they swear by these films, you know. So, you a, 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 even in Kill Bill, you will find elements from Faster Pussycat. So, that is the cultural impact of certain kinds of cult films. Ziggy Stardust was directed by D. A. Penbaker and uh, uh, starred the rock legend David Bowie in the lead. The film celebrates rock and roll the glam rock and also offers a treatise on celebrity, life, death and loss of fame. It had a cult following primarily because of its music and the androgynous appeal of David Bowie. In more recent times, we have someone like uh, Tim Burton who has made mass attacks which is uh, his take on Edward's science fiction films of the 50s. The setting is uh, Washington DC and Las Vegas. The plot is very simple. The earth is visited by a group of Martians and different people across America respond differently. Here is a scene from Mars Attacks. Cult films are uh, often confused with the so called B pictures. Now, what are B pictures? Um, they are not much of a difference, let me tell you, they are used, the two terms are used interchangeably. B films are those that have questionable taste and decorum, again like cult films, they would rarely find a place um, among top notch film festivals and also at the Oscar awards. They are also characterized by uh, eccentric characters, by unpredictability of the plot and general idiosyncrasy. Now, um, Quentin Tarantino's Reservoir Dogs is a perfect example of a B picture when it was first released, Tarantino was not what he has become now. So, again it has quirky and eccentric written all over it. The characters are unpredictable, the violence is gratuitous and the, the film uh, as in uh, the category of or in the convention of all B pictures, it was cheaply made. It did not win any major award at the time of its release. Again, as is, uh, as is characteristic in Tarantino, the film borrows liberally from films from the past, including the color coded names of its characters from 1974 film, The Taking of Palham 1, 2, 3. Uh, also, the last 20 minutes of the film is uh, yeah, a total, you know, borrowing from the Hong Kong film City on fire. 
Reservoir Dogs did poorly at the box office since reviewers warned of the audience, especially because of its famous ear splicing scene. However, today it is a cult film where the die hard fans can rattle off all the dialogues without much prodding. I would like to end today's talk with Reservoir Dogs, the opening scene. <laughs>